If Jane Austen was able to visit the late 20th century for just one day, she would undoubtedly be extremely surprised and highly delighted at the progress of her six novels. For her to walk into any high street bookseller, cinema or video shop, the sight of so many versions of Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Northanger Abbey, Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion would put her into the highest of spirits. She would also be greatly diverted by the copious quantity of reviews and literary criticisms written about her novels. Never in the history of English literature have so many words been penned about so few. However, her sense of humour would not fail her, and perhaps she would repeat these lines which portrayed her as such a modest author in her day. I think I may boast myself to be, with all possible vanity, the most unlearned and uninformed female who ever dared to be an authoress. If we consider a selection of comments made about Jane Austen's work, there is great variation. From Sir Walter Scott's admiration of her most distinguished characters, well-bred country gentlemen and ladies sketched with originality and precision, written in Jane's own lifetime, to D.H. Lawrence's abhorrence of a narrow-gutted spinster who he felt to be thoroughly unpleasant, English in the bad, snobbish sense of the word. It is not the passage of time that marks the difference, though. Kipling wrote poems in praise of Jane Austen that were responsible for inspiring a Janeite following, but Charlotte Bronte, closer to Jane Austen in time, found her disappointing. Charlotte may have accused Jane of being out of touch with the passions, but it is obvious that Jane inflamed the passions in her readers, with the people who dislike her work doing so with as much venom as those who revere her work with such love. In a time when the novel was frowned upon in some areas of cultured society, the Reverend George Austen, Jane's father, kept a good library. The family would spend evenings reading aloud. They were great novel readers and not ashamed of being so, going as far as to subscribe to a private lending library. Newspapers and letters were also read aloud, with the Austins delighting in anything humorous. As a consequence, when letters were written, it was with a view to having them read out loud. Therefore, it would have been a natural progression for Jane Austen in her early teenage years, returned from school, to take up writing. She was bright and witty, and used her developing literary skills to amuse her family. A good example of this is The History of England, that she wrote when she was only 16 years old. Her sense of humour was already playful, as we can see from the title she gave it. A History of England by a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian. This history of England is part of the three volumes usually referred to as Jane Austen's Juvenilia. Jane herself called them Volume the First, Second and Third. The best known is probably the second volume, Love and Friendship, from which the history of England comes. These notebooks are full of tales and family jokes, and although these have all been published, Jane Austen obviously felt her youthful years could have been better spent. Her niece, Caroline, remembers her Aunt Jane's warning. If I would take her advice, I should cease writing till I was 16. She had herself often wished she had read more and written less in the corresponding years of her own life. Despite this comment, Jane Austen was well read and, as we've already mentioned, was an unashamed admirer of the English novel. In Jane Austen's day, the novel still had a dubious reputation because of its initial tendency in the 17th century to be associated with romance and illicit love. The novel, which did much to change people's attitude and perhaps has the best claim to be the first English novel, is Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, published in 1719. The strongest feature is its powerful narrative, and although a desert island is a romantic enough notion, the psychological explorations of Crusoe staying sane are a million miles away from the love trysts of the genre's early examples. The next landmark for Jane would have been Samuel Richardson's Pamela, 
published in 1740. This one, if not about romance exactly, certainly held true to the original novel subject matter of illicit love. Written in letter form, it looks at the seduction of the heroine, Pamela, and her attempts to maintain her virtue. There were complaints of impropriety, and Richardson did modify his work. Richardson had significant influence on Jane Austen's work, as did Samuel Johnson. Johnson is perhaps best known for producing the first English dictionary, but it was the quality of his fine moral writing which impressed Jane so much. She also loved the humour of the very earthy Tom Jones by Henry Fielding, which was published in 1749. There was, however, a more serious side to Fielding. He was a magistrate who fought hard against corruption, and there are difficult issues tackled in his work. Less serious a little later, and a great influence on the work of Jane Austen, were the novels of Fanny Burney. Evelina was published in 1778, Cecilia in 1782, and Camilla in 1778, and Jane does make reference to them. The theme of the novels is the entrance of a young girl into society, and this is certainly in the background of Eleanor and Marianne, Jane Austen's attempt at a novel in letter form, after the style of Samuel Richardson, one of her favourite authors. Even at this early stage, Jane Austen's attention to characterisation is sharp and colourful, leading us to suspect that Jane was an avid people-watcher who could also eavesdrop to great effect. Eleanor and Marianne has a light-hearted feel to it, written when Jane was just 20. However, this becomes considerably more serious by the time it is reworked as Sense and Sensibility. This may have had something to do with the life experience Jane acquired between 1795, when she wrote Eleanor and Marianne, and 1797, when she started to write Sense and Sensibility. She discovered the evil designs young men could have on young women, and also the avaricious designs young women could have on young men. The disastrous nature of seduction for young women described in Richardson's Pamela was no doubt proved accurate by gossip whispered in Jane's own circle of acquaintance. Tales of poor unfortunate creatures who had been robbed of their virtue were to be pitied and whose speedy death, preferably by consumption, was to be wished for as the only dignified outcome of such troubles. Jane Austen uses such revelations to great advantage in the plot of Sense and Sensibility, which was her first published novel in 1811. It tells the story of two young women, Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood. Society expected a great deal of its young ladies, teaching them every accomplishment imaginable in order to attract a husband. It was considered the duty of every young woman to accept any eligible man who offered. Things were beginning to change, though, and for women of Jane Austen's generation, the idea of marrying for love was no longer unthinkable. This was due in part to the growth of Romanticism, a movement which encouraged passionate reactions to every life experience, waging war against the fashion of personal insincerity. The Dashwood sisters mirror this conflict, with Eleanor being the perfect exponent of classicism, with its emphasis on compliant, controlled behaviour, discipline and moderation, which was exactly what polite society expected. Marianne, by contrast, allows her soul to be in turmoil, passionately looking for love and fulfilment. Nothing matters beyond what she feels, with no thought spared for what polite society may think. Sense and Sensibility quickly becomes a study into the struggle to find a balance between the two sisters and the two principles. This is not the only theme, and right at the beginning of this novel, Jane Austen introduces a subject that crops up in some shape or form in most of her work. Eleanor, Marianne, their mother and young sister Margaret suffer great indignity and poverty because, as females, they are unable to inherit the estate of their dead father, Mr Henry Dashwood. The estate passes to his son by a previous marriage, Mr John Dashwood. 
the Dashwood ladies are dependent upon John Dashwood's sense of duty, and he lets them down very badly, despite the fact that his father asked him to provide an income for them. As a consequence, Mrs. Dashwood and the girls are thrown out of their own home and financial restraints force them to accept the offer of a cottage in Devon from a wealthy relation. Despite their comparative poverty and their obligation to their wealthy relation, Jane Austen expounds the virtue of a modest life in the country. This was probably due to the fact that at the time of writing this, she was living at the modest rectory at Steventon in Hampshire. Jane's father was the rector, and the family were well aware of the need to carefully manage a budget, especially as there were eight Austin children. This description makes the straitened circumstances of the Dashwood ladies seem at least bearable. It was a pleasant, fertile spot, well wooded and rich in pasture. As a house, Barton Cottage, though small, was comfortable and compact, but as a cottage, it was defective, for the building was regular, the roof was tiled, the window shutters were not painted green, nor were the walls covered in honeysuckles. Before reaching Devon, Eleanor has fallen in love with Edward Ferras, the brother of Mr John Dashwood's wife, Fanny. Fanny makes it very clear that Edward's family expect him to marry well, and the poverty-stricken, though admittedly genteel Eleanor, would not be acceptable. Eleanor sadly resigns herself to this fact and moves away to Devon, understanding that Edward has to consent to the wishes of his family and somehow manages not to take this as a personal slight. Not long after her arrival in Devon, Marianne attracts the attention of the eligible older Colonel Brandon, who she dismisses as far too aged and really rather boring. Then she is literally swept off her feet by a young, tall, handsome stranger. Marianne, while out walking, has fallen and damaged her ankle and is unable to move. The gentleman offered his services and perceiving that her modesty declined what her situation rendered necessary, took her up in his arms without further delay and carried her down the hill. Marianne throws caution to the wind and Willoughby, her handsome rescuer, can be in no doubt about her feelings. He takes full advantage of this with little regard for Marianne's reputation. Her family expects him to propose marriage, as does Marianne herself. Willoughby does not propose, but instead mysteriously disappears to London. Rather than sitting around in the country waiting for his return, Marianne accepts an invitation from a family friend, the eccentric Mrs Jennings, to go to London. She then persuades Eleanor that this is what they should do, even though Eleanor feels that chasing after Willoughby to London may be indiscreet. It is interesting to note the change in Jane Austen's tone when the scenes change to London, almost giving the impression that bad things are bad to happen in town. Marianne is completely preoccupied with seeing Willoughby. She is blatantly oblivious to anything but him. As time ticks by, she fails to make contact with him, despite the fact that she has been writing to Willoughby every day since her arrival in London. The practice of letter-writing had very strict taboos in the 1790s. Unless a young lady was engaged to a gentleman, etiquette forbade them to write to each other. Marianne breaks all the rules, takes quite a risk for her day, and Willoughby still ignores her. When they accidentally meet at a ball, he is very uncomfortable and embarrassed as he has become engaged to an heiress, a situation necessitated by his financial needs. This passage portrays Marianne's realisation that her love for Willoughby is futile and she expresses her horror in such shocking terms that the entire assembly can't help but notice. Eleanor was robbed of all presence of mind by such an address and was unable to say a word. But the feelings of her sister were instantly expressed. Her face crimsoned over and she exclaimed in a voice of the greatest emotion, Good God, Willoughby, what is the meaning of this? Have you not received my letters? Will you not shake hands with me? 
after this terrible experience and Eleanor's discovery that her beloved Edward is secretly engaged, the Miss Dashwoods return sadly disappointed to the safety of the countryside. Marianne becomes gravely ill, but thankfully recovers and both girls settle down to Devonshire life older and wiser. Marianne sees the virtues of the ever faithful Colonel Brandon and they marry. Eleanor gets her man too, as when Edward loses his fortune, his fickle fiance ceases to find him desirable, leaving Edward free to follow his heart and marry Eleanor. Jane Austen relied on her worldly wise older brother Henry to help her get Sense and Sensibility published. There would have been three options open to her publisher, Thomas Edgerton. If he had felt confident, he could have bought the copyright outright. If he was less confident, he could have offered to pay the publishing costs and take a share of the receipts. In this case, he must have felt he was taking a gamble, as he offered to publish on commission. This meant Jane Austen covering her own printing costs, but taking all the receipts and paying Edgerton a handling fee. As the cost would have been between 100 and 200 pounds, it is likely that brother Henry lent Jane the money to publish, with Jane keeping her copyright and a profit from this edition of about 140 pounds. Edgerton was evidently happy with the way the first run of 750 copies sold, as he offered Jane 110 pounds for the copyright of Pride and Prejudice outright. The manuscript had been titled First Impressions, but Pride and Prejudice was chosen as an alternative due to its alliteration, making it sound similar to the now proven Sense and Sensibility. Pride and Prejudice, although only Jane Austen's second published novel, is probably the best known and some would argue her finest work. It was completed as First Impressions in August 1797 and Jane's own father was impressed enough with her manuscript to offer it to the publisher Cadell. The manuscript was rejected without even being read. The Reverend George Austin did not live long enough to see his daughter's work published as he died and was buried here in Bath in 1805. But it must have pleased Jane greatly that he admired her early writing and she must have felt especially proud at seeing Pride and Prejudice in print in 1813, justifying George Austin's recognition of her potential. Elizabeth Bennet, Jane Austen's heroine of Pride and Prejudice, is as close a picture of the young Jane as we are likely to get. And if she is not exactly like Jane, she is exactly how Jane would have liked to have been. Elizabeth is one of five sisters. She is the second in age and beauty, but the first in sharp wit and intelligence. She is her father's favourite, as he loves her ready wit, sense of humour and cleverness on a par with his own. He was foolish enough, as a young man, to be attracted to a pretty face, Mrs. Bennet, who proves to be a very silly woman. The older she gets, the sillier she gets, and his way of coping with this is to tease her wickedly, as this dialogue between them shows. She's asked him to visit a new young man in the neighbourhood, in possession of a good fortune and in want of a wife, so that, as is proper for the time, the newcomer, Mr Bingley, can be introduced to her daughters. You are over-scrupulous, surely. I dare say Mr Bingley will be very glad to see you, and I will send him a few lines by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses of the girls. Though I must throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others. And I'm sure she is not half so handsome as Jane, nor half so good-humoured as Lydia, but you are always giving her the preference. They have none of them much to recommend them, replied he. They are all silly and ignorant like other girls, but Lizzie has something more of quickness than her sisters. For the Bennet family, five daughters and no sons was something of a nightmare, as their property is entailed away to a male cousin upon the death of Mr Bennet. 
we all laugh at Mrs. Bennet and her hysteria about what will become of them if Mr. Bennet dies, but she does have a valid point. When handsome, wealthy Mr. Bingley moves into Netherfield, the neighbouring country estate to the Bennet family home at Longbourn, Mrs. Bennet hopes that he will marry one of the girls. The eldest, most beautiful sister Jane, genuinely falls in love with him, and Mr. Bingley feels the same way about her. Then news is heard that Mr. Bingley has brought a friend with him, an eligible gentleman of exceptional means from Derbyshire. Mrs. Bennet has high hopes that she will be able to get a second daughter married, but when Mr. Darcy is introduced, his proud behaviour makes this most unlikely. Mr. Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien, and the report, which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance, of his having 10,000 a year. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man. The ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr. Bingley, and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening, till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of his popularity. For he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company and above being pleased. And not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance and being unworthy to be compared with his friend. Jane Austen, as this description shows, gives us very little information about Darcy, but as the emphasis is on his large estate in Derbyshire, it is perhaps an appropriate moment to take a look at exactly what Jane had in mind when she wrote this. This is Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, thought to be the inspiration for Pemberley, Mr Darcy's ancestral home. Although there's no actual proof that Jane Austen visited here, the circumstantial evidence is quite strong. We know that Jane and her mother enjoyed visiting stately homes, and in Jane's time it was quite acceptable for gentlefolk to apply to the housekeeper of a grand house to be shown around, just as she describes in Pride and Prejudice. Chatsworth would have most definitely been one of the houses to visit and Jane even mentions it by name before she takes us to Pemberley. There are also certain key paintings here which are of great interest. The portrait of the sixth Duke of Devonshire, as we have just seen, is a perfect illustration for a young man of Darcy's social standing. This beautiful painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds would have been here in Jane Austen's day, and it gives us another reason to think that she may well have been a visitor. The subject is the fifth Duchess of Devonshire and her young daughter, who would have been the mother and sister of our handsome Duke. Mother and daughter share the same Christian name, Georgiana, the name chosen by Jane for Mr Darcy's sister. This was one of Jane Austen's trademarks, as many of her characters' names were taken from people who came to her notice. With this information and the images of Chatsworth giving us a better understanding of Mr Darcy, we now have one of literature's most enigmatic heroes to go with our intelligent and witty heroine. But Pride and Prejudice is not just about Darcy and Elizabeth. In the background, we have the courtship of Jane Bennet and Mr Bingley, as well as Bingley's wonderfully appalling sisters, Caroline and Louisa. This interchange between Darcy, the sisters and Elizabeth shows how clever Jane Austen was at creating realistic background characters. At that moment, they were met from another walk by Mrs Hurst and Elizabeth herself. I did not know you intended to walk, said Miss Bingley, in some confusion lest they had been overheard. You have used us abominably ill, answered Mrs Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then taking the disengaged arm of Mr Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr Darcy felt their rudeness and immediately said, this walk is not wide enough for our party, we had better go into the avenue. But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye.
This incident is charged with humour and Jane's appreciation of manners making for a ridiculous moment. Jane Austen warms to this theme beautifully and soon after the garden event she introduces the delightful obsequious clergyman Mr Collins. Mr Collins is the male cousin who will inherit Longbourn upon the death of Mr Bennet and he has been ordered by Lady Catherine de Bourgh, his much esteemed patroness, to find a wife and he decides to make amends to the Bennet girls by choosing one of them. This dubious honour falls to Elizabeth, and we learn a lot about her character from the incident, as despite her mother's entreaties, she refuses him, and when forced to speak her mind, she does so with much spirit. I thank you again and again for the honour you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings in every respect forbid it. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me now as an elegant female intending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. The dialogue which then follows between Elizabeth, her mother and her father shows Jane Austen at her brilliant best. With very few words, she sums up the characters of Mr and Mrs Bennet and she also achieves considerable sympathy from the reader for her heroine. Mrs. Bennet delivers these lines with escalating hysteria. Oh, Mr. Bennet, you are wanted immediately. We are all in an uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him. And if you do not make haste, he will change his mind and not have her. Mr. Bennet, sat in his library, reacts in his usual quiet manner. But Jane Austen has depicted his character so accurately that even at this early stage in the novel, we know there will be a sting in the tail of what he has to say. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. While the reader has been distracted by this hilarious incident, Mr Bingley and Jane have become more and more attached and Mr Darcy realises that a proposal of marriage is imminent. He is horrified at the prospect of Mr Bingley marrying into such an atrocious family as the Bennets and enlists the help of Bingley's sisters to remove the lovesick fellow to London where Jane will no longer be a temptation. Darcy's plan works. Jane is devastated, thinking that Mr Bingley cared nothing for her after all. Elizabeth refuses to believe this and soon works out that Darcy is the cause of her sister's misery. This whole incident backfires on Darcy as he finds that despite all his words of wisdom to his friend about the folly of a connection with the Bennet family, he, Darcy, the great and good, cannot resist Elizabeth Bennet and her fine eyes. He is obsessed with her and makes her an offer of marriage. Darcy's proposal does little to flatter Elizabeth. In vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. He then makes matters much worse when he tries to defend his honesty. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? To congratulate myself on the hope of relations whose condition in life is so decidedly beneath my own? Elizabeth, needless to say, refuses him, and the story progresses with both hero and heroine learning the error of their pride and prejudice, respectively. When Elizabeth finds herself at Pemberley, Mr Darcy's estate in Derbyshire, she has to admit that it is a property that justifies a degree of pride. Elizabeth was delighted. She had never seen a place for which nature had done more, or where natural beauty had been so little counteracted by an awkward taste. They were all of them warm in their admiration, and at that moment she felt that to be mistress of Pemberley might be something. 
This visit to Pemberley not only changes Elizabeth's view of Darcy to a more favourable one, but also ours as the reader. From this point on, we are all willing Elizabeth and Darcy to get together, and when it finally happens, as a result of Mr Darcy's heroic salvation of the entire Bennet family, everyone is satisfied with the reward of a suitably happy ending. <laughs> Of all Jane Austen's novels, Pride and Prejudice is the best known. Many film adaptations have been made, the story has been used for plays and even musicals. These have come and gone, each one reflective of the period of time it was produced in. But Elizabeth Bennet and Fitzwilliam Darcy remain. It's been suggested that Darcy is little more than a device to get Elizabeth well married, but having considered the general public's reaction to more recent productions, Mr Darcy certainly still manages to set female hearts aflutter. As for Elizabeth, Jane Austen says... I confess I think her as delightful a creature as ever appeared in print, and how I shall be able to tolerate those who do not like her at least I do not know. The fact that readers today continue to fall in love with Elizabeth is testimony to Jane Austen's skill as a writer. Northanger Abbey, although not the next novel to be published, logically belongs to the group of three novels drafted while Jane was living at the rectory at Steventon. It was not published until after Jane's death in 1817, but ironically, it was the first work that she sold. In its original form, the manuscript was sold to the publisher Richard Crosby for £10 in 1803. Then titled Susan, the novel failed to appear in print, really disappointing Jane. As time went on, her disappointment turned to dislike of Mr Crosby, and this became even worse when she inquired after the fate of Susan. Mr Crosby, apparently, with little consideration for her feelings, answered that he was not in any way bound to publish it, and if she didn't like it, she could buy it back for £10. She didn't take him up on this until 1816, when Henry supervised the purchase. By this time, she had experienced considerable success with her other titles, but as this had been anonymously, Crosby had no idea of the value of what he was selling, and Henry Austin was wise enough not to enlighten him. At this time, Jane Austen revised the manuscript as far as she could, but a great deal of time had passed and a great many changes had taken place since its origins in the late 1790s. George III, who was on the throne for the whole of Jane's lifetime, had become ill in 1788. We now know that the poor king was suffering from porphyria, which, with the benefit of hindsight, explains his very disturbed behaviour. Unfortunately, the physicians of the day translated this as madness, and his son, the indolent Prince George, used this against his father to try and take power, succeeding with the passing of the Regency Act in 1811. Britain had been at war with France since Jane was 17, and she was nearly 40 when it ended with the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. With two brothers in the Navy, Jane was very aware of what was going on, hearing much about Napoleon, and no doubt much enjoyed hearing news of Nelson's victory over him at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. The French Revolution had shaken the aristocratic order of Britain, as had the loss of the American colonies in the American War of Independence. The egalitarian propaganda that started to appear was living proof that an aristocratic hierarchy was not the only way to run a country. This, combined with our own industrial revolution, was making for great change in the British social landscape. Northanger Abbey begins in the imaginary Wiltshire village of Fullerton. Catherine Morland, our unlikely heroine, is the daughter of a clergyman and one of ten children. Here Jane was writing from experience, as she undoubtedly is doing in this extract. This green slope is at the site of the rectory in Steventon, where Jane would have played as a child. 
What a strange, unaccountable character. For with all these symptoms of profligacy at ten years old, she had neither a bad heart nor a bad temper, was seldom stubborn, scarcely ever quarrelsome, and very kind to the little ones with few interruptions of tyranny. She was, moreover, noisy and wild, hated confinement and cleanliness, and loved nothing so well in the world as rolling down the green slope at the back of the house. Catherine's love of dirt soon gives way to an improved complexion and curling hair. Then she's fortunate enough to be taken to Bath as the companion of Mrs. Allen, mistress of the chief property in Fullerton. Soon after arriving in Bath, she meets Isabella Thorpe, and they greatly enjoy each other's company, reading novels and sampling the delights of Bath. Bath provides the hero necessary for Catherine to fall in love with, and he's rather pleasant. Henry Tilney is handsome, clever and very sensible. When Catherine visits Northanger Abbey, his family home, a gothic horror of a property, she allows her novel reading to influence her judgment. Catherine's imagination runs away with her. General Tilney, Henry's father, is a good old-fashioned snob. The only reason he's invited Catherine to visit Northanger Abbey is because of a report that he's heard about Catherine's rich family. When Catherine hears of the very sudden death of Henry's mother, coupled with mysterious locked doors, it causes Catherine to jump to the conclusion that the general has done away with his wife and hidden her body somewhere in Northanger Abbey. Jane Austen used the device of the Gothic novel to inflame Catherine's imagination. The Gothic novel, usually a tale of the macabre and supernatural, inevitably set in haunted castles, graveyards, ruins or wild countryside, was at the height of its popularity in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Some Gothic novelists even went as far as to build houses based upon their Gothic fantasies. Strawberry Hill at Twickenham being a prime example. Henry has all the traits of a classical young man who disapproves of Gothic novels like Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Uldolfo, but uses his sense of balance to understand Catherine's hysteria. Dear Miss Morland, consider the dreadful nature of the suspicions you have entertained. What have you been judging from? Remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, that we are Christians. General Tilney knows nothing of Catherine's suspicions, but hears from the same source that told him of Catherine's richness that Catherine is in fact very poor. The general virtually throws her out of Northanger Abbey never to darken their doors again and forbids Henry to see her. Henry loves Catherine too much to let her go, follows her home and proposes. In the end, the general is mollified by the marriage of his daughter to a peer, and the proof that Catherine was not as poor as he thought, as both reports of her financial status were as inaccurate as each other. The next three novels were completely created at Chawton Cottage, the house Jane Austen's brother Edward provided for the widowed Mrs Austen and her daughters near Alton in Hampshire. They moved here in 1809, and the steady flow of publications continued with Mansfield Park in 1814. Just as with Elizabeth Bennet's character being the backbone of Pride and Prejudice, we have a similar situation in Mansfield Park. Fanny Price is the substance of Mansfield Park. Here, though, is where the similarities end. We meet Fanny when she's only ten years old, an interesting development for Jane Austen, exploring her heroine at a younger age. The Victorian novelists who followed Jane Austen's lead used this technique very well. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and George Eliot's Maggie Tulliver in Mill on the Floss, to name but two. Fanny has been sent from her poverty-stricken family in Portsmouth to be brought up by her rich relations, Sir Thomas and Lady Bertram, at Mansfield Park in Northamptonshire. 
This is a situation Jane Austen actually had first-hand experience of, as her brother Edward had been adopted by rich relations who had no children of their own. Although this may have seemed a perfectly logical solution as Jane's family had more mouths to feed than they could manage, young Edward must nevertheless have been awestruck by the huge estate he arrived at in Kent. Jane Austen perhaps expresses these feelings when Fanny arrives at Mansfield Park. The grandeur of the house astonished but could not console her. The rooms were too large for her to move with ease. Whatever she touched, she expected to injure, and she crept about in constant terror of something or other, often retreating towards her own chamber to cry. And the little girl who was spoken of in the drawing room when she left it at night, as seeming so desirably sensible of her peculiar good fortune, ended every day's sorrows by sobbing herself to sleep. Unlike Jane Austen's brother, who was the only child in the new household, Fanny has cousins to contend with. Tom, the eldest, is 17, Edmund is 16, and they are followed by the Miss Bertrams, Maria and Julia. As Fanny grows up, it is Edmund who forms a special friendship with her, as he's very kind. He helps her to write home to her beloved younger brother William, who has joined the Navy. When William gives Fanny a little amber cross, it is Edmund who provides the chain for her to wear it upon. These crosses were given to Jane and sister Cassandra by younger brother Charles, who of course was also in the Navy. It is accepted that William Price is based on Charles Austin. The consequence of Edmund's kindness is Fanny's undying love and devotion to him. Fanny is a very good girl who grows into a serious young woman. A sense of duty is a very strong motivating factor and, as with Jane herself, she's constantly juggling the principles of love, money and duty. She is a very stark contrast to her cousins Maria and Julia, who lack Fanny's moral fibre, which in Maria's case causes her to come to a bad end. Jane Austen uses the clever device of the cousins performing a play within the plot of the novel. Friends of the family, the charming Henry Crawford and his beautiful sister Mary are enlisted for the cast as is Maria's fiancé, Mr Rushworth. They choose to perform Lover's Vows by Mrs Inchbald. Fanny wants no part of it and the Bertram girls behave atrociously. True to Fanny's prediction, all ends in tears. As the story proceeds, Edmund falls under the spell of Mary Crawford and Fanny is pursued by the rakish Henry Crawford. When Henry proposes, the Bertram family become very angry with Fanny when she refuses him. They think it her duty to marry him despite his improper behaviour with the engaged Maria. It is interesting to speculate here that the goodness of Fanny could have saved Henry Crawford as could Edmund have helped Mary. Fanny sticks to her guns and Henry, true to form, runs away with the now married Maria. When Mary Crawford refuses to condemn her brother's actions, Edmund realises the flaws in her character. Enter stage left, good, faithful Fanny, whose determination to do what is right is rewarded by a proposal from Edmund. Mansfield Park was published like Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice by Thomas Edgerton. On the 9th of May 1814, he placed this advertisement in the star. Mansfield Park, a novel, in three volumes, by the author of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. It must have been disappointing to Jane Austen when the journals were silent. There were no reviews. And although some people found the novel entertaining, even members of Jane's own family had difficulty liking Miss Fanny Price. Mrs Austin found her insipid, and Jane's niece Anna couldn't bear her. The reception of Fanny, combined with the fact that Edmund Bertram is no Mr Darcy, definitely prevented Mansfield Park becoming as successful as Pride and Prejudice. However, Edgerton did sell his first run of 1,250 copies by November, but he refused to print a second edition. This was enough to set Jane looking for a new publisher for her next novel, Emma. She was confident about this novel, even allowing the reader the freedom to dislike her heroine. 
I am going to take a heroine whom no one but myself will much like. Jane Austen knew that a heroine like Emma, who we would love to hate, particularly in the early part of the novel, would enhance her story. Just as with Pride and Prejudice, she opens Emma very quickly, and we are soon equally engrossed. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Emma and her father, the neurotic Mr Woodhouse, occupy Hartfield, the grandest house in Highbury, a large village. Here we see the town of Leatherhead, which according to Jane's nephew, James Austin Lee, was the inspiration for Highbury. I am writing to say that my aunt, Miss Jane Austen, once told me that the Highbury described in her novel Emma was the town of Leatherhead. Emma considers herself to be the grand lady of the village, and with no one but her doting father to correct her, she causes havoc, trying to arrange marriages for all those around her. That is, until her older, handsome brother-in-law, Mr Knightley, tries to take her in hand and stop her meddling. As the story develops, a mystery unfolds before us, and the reader needs to turn detective. Handsome newcomer Frank Churchill seems to have a very strange effect on genteel, educated, but catastrophically poor Jane Fairfax, the niece of well-intentioned but eccentric Miss Bates. Emma is taken in by Mr Churchill and egged on by his indiscreet behaviour is unforgivably rude to Miss Bates on a visit they all make to Box Hill. In her heart, Emma knows she's done wrong, but she tries to laugh it off as a silly joke. Mr Knightley tells her in no uncertain terms that she of all people should have known better. He also warns her about Frank Churchill. So when the Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax riddle is answered, Emma has her own mortification to deal with, as well as knowing that she should have listened to Mr Knightley. It is at this point when Emma is at her most vulnerable, coping with painful self-enlightenment, that Mr Knightley declares his love for her. Emma has the grace to accept him and appreciate his value to her. It is not only Emma, however, who learns from these experiences. Jane Austen seems to thoroughly enjoy shaking up Mr Knightley. For a man who has said precisely what he thinks at every previous point in the novel, this proposal takes a bit of deciphering. Here Jane Austen's style has matured richly, charging this passage with more than humour. There is a real understanding of the nature of the human condition. I cannot make speeches, Emma he soon resumed, and in a tone of such sincere, decided, intelligible tenderness, and was tolerably convincing. If I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more, but you know what I am, you hear nothing but truth from me. I have blamed you and lectured you, and you have borne it as no other woman in England would have borne it. Bear with the truths I would tell you now, dearest Emma, as well as you have borne with them. The manner, perhaps, may have as little to recommend them. God knows I have been a very indifferent lover, but you understand me. Yes, you see, you understand my feelings and will return them if you can. As with her previous novels, it was Henry who advised Jane about getting a more committed publisher for Emma, but as Henry's health was poor at the time, it was Jane herself who applied to John Murray, a major publisher and friend of Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron. Jane was staying with Henry at Hans Place to help to nurse him, and when Murray replied, he offered £450 to buy the copyright of Emma, but he also wanted the copyright of Mansfield Park and Sense and Sensibility included. Jane was rather amused and called him a rogue, but a civil one. It was all a rather slow, drawn-out process until she made the decision to dedicate Emma to the Prince Regent, who was known to be a collector of her work. 
At first, it had been in deference to Mr. James Stainer Clark, the Prince's librarian at Carlton House. Her relationship with Mr. Clark is an interesting one. Jane was introduced to him while she was staying with Henry at Hans Place. Jane admired Mr. Clark's work, but when he made a suggestion about the storyline for her next novel, she resisted his helpful advice. She chose her subjects carefully and, interestingly, was always concerned about disgracing her previous work. Although she was pleased with Emma, she still worried about its reception, feeling it inferior in wit to Pride and Prejudice and lacking the good sense of Mansfield Park. The royal dedication, despite her reservations, did her nothing but good. Murray certainly moved at a much faster pace once the dedication was in place. In the end, Emma was published at the author's own expense with a 10% commission payable to Murray. Murray also published a second edition of Mansfield Park. Emma, with its grand royal dedication, was well received, but Mansfield Park was a disaster, even for Murray. It ended up being remaindered at two shillings and sixpence a copy instead of the wholesale price of twelve and six. Jane Austen finished Emma on the 29th of March, 1815, and began Persuasion, her last completed novel, on the 8th of August, 1815. It was just a month later that Jane's health began to fail. She had Addison's disease. Not that anyone could have known this at the time, as the disease was not documented until 1849. Jane slowly became more debilitated by her condition, deteriorating as persuasion progressed. Yet again, Jane Austen manages to find an original heroine, the overlooked and much put upon Anne Elliot, who is completely different to those who had passed before. Jane described Anne as almost too good for her, and we watch the more mature Anne, aged 27, uncomplaining but fading away into the non-entity of spinsterdom before our very eyes. Anne's father is an impoverished baronet whose imprudent extravagance has been his downfall. This description sums him up. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book but the baronetage. There he found occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one. This was the page at which the favourite volume always opened. Elliot of Kellynch Hall. As a result of his impropriety, their family home is let and the family moved to live in Bath. Eight years before the novel began, Anne had been engaged to a Captain Wentworth, a poor but respectable naval man, but is persuaded by a friend to break off the engagement. Anne has regretted this, and at the beginning of Persuasion, she has given up all hope of finding love again. The novel has some of Jane Austen's most descriptive passages, taking us from Somerset to Bath and on to Lyme Regis. There is an underlying autumnal theme, as this passage illustrates. Her pleasure in the walk must arise from the exercise and the day, from the view of the last smiles of the year upon the tawny leaves and withered hedges, and from repeating to herself some few of the thousand poetical descriptions extant of autumn, that season of peculiar and inexhaustible influence on the mind of taste and tenderness. The plot is enhanced by the new tenant of Kalinch Hall, Admiral Croft, being the husband of Captain Wentworth's sister. Captain Wentworth sweeps back into Anne's life, having made his fortune, rendering him on his return most eligible. Anne has the indignity of watching other young ladies set their caps at him, while her heart still aches because of her undying love for him. She silently waits, and her patience is rewarded when Captain Wentworth declares that he has never stopped loving her, and Anne glories in becoming a sailor's wife. Jane Austen herself would have liked to have been a sailor's wife, and no doubt she wrote the happy ending that she would have chosen for herself. Fortune did not smile upon Jane, and sadly she did not live to see Persuasion published, let alone find a sailor to marry. 
she did begin another novel called Sanditon, which had all the hallmarks of an epic Victorian novel. Her wit was as sharp and brilliant as it had been in Pride and Prejudice, and despite her illness, Jane was still moving with the times. Sanditon, if completed, would have been a satirical novel about a changing society, which would have marked yet another development in Jane Austen's maturing literary ability. John Murray published Persuasion in 1818, a year after Jane Austen's death on July the 18th, 1817. Henry Austin arranged this and it was combined with the manuscript bought back from Crosby, revised as Northanger Abbey. Although Jane Austen enjoyed the thought of earning money from her writing, she spent very little of it and her beloved sister Cassandra inherited the grand sum of 561 pounds and two shillings. For us, Jane Austen also left a legacy six very precious and priceless novels that take the modern reader back to the Regency period. Despite the lack of political statement, we are left with a snapshot of a moment in time, and perhaps because of that very lack of political content, we have six novels blessed with great readability. Sometimes this readability disguises the fact that Jane Austen underpinned all of her writing with a strong sense of morality. Jane may have allowed us to laugh at her characters who lacked moral fibre, but no good comes of any of them. It is only the naturally good or the morally reformed who win through in the end. By using humour so effectively, we perhaps accept Jane Austen's moral judgments far more readily than we would if her writing had taken a more serious tone. It is appropriate, therefore, to give Jane Austen the last word, because it was she who understood better than anyone else, past, present or future, just exactly what she was capable of. She stuck to what she did well, did it in her own way and refused to be swayed by flattery to be anything less than true to herself. This is the secret of her success. I could not sit seriously down to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life. And if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or at other people, I'm sure I should be hung before I'd finished the first chapter. No, I must keep to my own style and go on in my own way. And though I may never succeed again in that, I am convinced that I should totally fail in any other.